Hi, everyone. This is the 50 States High Pointing Podcast and YouTube channel. What started off as a project for a communications class has turned into something that I actually love doing. I have the privilege of providing the platform for people to talk about the extraordinary things they do in the outdoors. High pointing is the challenge of reaching the highest elevation in each of the 50 states. High pointers don't get paid for their hobby, no one is sponsored by an outdoor company, and people fit this challenge into their everyday lives that also include careers and family. I found through these interviews that people who attempt this challenge are incredible and genuinely enjoy talking about their experiences. If you consider yourself a high pointer and you want to share your story on this podcast or interview, please send me an email at 50 states high pointing podcast at gmail.com. It has been a pleasure speaking with every high pointer. I hope you enjoy. Welcome to the 50 states high pointing podcast. I'm your host, Lauren, and the high pointer that we're speaking with today is Dean from Wisconsin. Dean, welcome. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. This is going to be fun. So why don't you tell everyone first, what got you started high pointing and really what got you into the outdoors in general? I, I must have been deployed or probably Europe. And there's a lot of mountains in Germany and especially Southern Germany where I was assigned. And I never really even knew there was a high pointing, especially a state high pointing, anything even directed towards that. But when I'd be driving down the the highways in Germany or the back roads, I'd see a big mountain or a hill and I'm like, oh, I'd really like to climb that. Just something attracted me to go to a top of a mountain. I, I don't know what it is. I can't explain it, but I, I think it's a lot of my fitness. I like uh, running, biking, hiking, all that. But just something about mountains, looking up at a mountain and it's like something I need to conquer. It's like something bigger than myself that I want to accomplish and overcome. I, I, that's really how I got into it. And then later on, uh, I don't know, maybe four, five, six, seven years ago, I started seeing on Facebook about 50 state high pointing. And I started following that. And there was a fellow airman, an Air Force person that had started a program called the USAF, United States Air Force 50 States High Pointing Challenge. So I started wow. that, and that was really cool to, to kind of get introduced to. And, and it really went from there. For our listeners and viewers that are watching on YouTube, they can see a very distinct background in the dome that you are doing this interview from. So why don't you talk about where you are right now, too? Okay, so I'm in Idaho near Garden Valley right now. And being retired from the Air Force, I've got my really winters wide open. I can pretty much do anything I want and go where I want to. Back home in Wisconsin, I've got a campground that I own and manage that I actually rent out campsites at hipcamp.com. And of course, I've got to be there for that through the summer. And really, the camping season there is only May through October. So I saw a posting on Facebook in one of the specific pages. I don't recall which one it was. But a gentleman was looking for somebody to be a caretaker at a ranch up here in the mountains. And they're looking for somebody that can operate heavy equipment, do construction, um, cut firewood, run chainsaws, things like that. So I applied for it, sent my resume, and he really wanted a veteran from what he had told me anyway. So I, long story short, I got hired. So I'm here in Idaho for six months living in this geodesic dome up on the edge of a, a granite cliff and kind of liking it. So that's where I am. It looks beautiful. It's nice. Great view to wake up to every day. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. And, and like Dean told me before this interview started, we're going to watch the sunset during this interview. So I look right. forward to that. Yeah. <laughs> So, so we left off with the 50 States High Pointing Challenge in the Air Force. So where did you go from there? Well, I had done some high points before that, just a, a few, like my home state of Wisconsin. It's, it's really only uh, 30, 40 miles from where I was born. So I'd go there, not really realizing it, going there for the reason of high pointing a state high point, but there's a really cool tower there. It's got a great view, and, and I went there a few times. So I really started high pointing before the USAF 50 States Challenge, but the the Air Force Challenge kind of got me into it a little deeper. And then after I started climbing with them, I would say 2012, 13, I really started focusing on my own endeavors of climbing some state high points. And that's really where it went. Wow. So how many have you done? Uh, 18 now. Great. Mostly wow. Western. 
um, where I was stationed in Florida. Of course, I did the Florida one, which is a uh, drive to. I drove up yeah. one weekend to Alabama, uh, Mississippi, just to get the, knock those out. And but really, most of them are Western, the Western high points, some of the tougher ones. And Montana, They're fun. one we can talk about later. What we did with the, the Air Force crew. What are some of your favorite high pointing stories of? Just you as an individual high pointing, and then we'll get to the Air Force team later. Okay. If you're referring to state high points, uh, probably I did Boundary, Nevada alone. I've really done almost all of them alone. Texas alone, New Mexico alone, and Minnesota, Michigan. But the Montana one was probably my favorite, not only because it was with an Air Force, fellow Air Force personnel, but the challenge, the danger. But I've also climbed high points around the world. I've done Kilimanjaro in Africa and Aconcagua in Argentina as a high point yeah. for those continents. But the Montana probably was the most memorable. For sure. And and rightly so. And I will put a link to the article oh, that okay. highlights um, that what you and your team did in Montana in the show notes for YouTube and the podcast. Great. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um why don't we go into now what you did with your airmen in Montana? But the Air Force 50 States Challenge team, it's not a specific team. It's its more or less designed to, well, we have Air Force bases all over the country in many, many states. And it's tailored to somebody initiates the action. Hey, I want to maybe consider climbing Montana, for example. And we do have a couple Air Force bases in Montana, but nobody really pursued leading that effort. So I contacted the... 50 states high point team manager and started conversing with him and communicating with him. And just, and we determined, Hey, why don't I lead this? So it's really putting the word out. Once you accept the challenge as a leader for this specific trip, you put the word out through that website or on Facebook, uh, air force pages, putting the word out through air force communication systems, emails to, uh, fitness, uh, there's an MWR in the Air Force, Morale, Welfare, and Recreation. It's a program that out, a lot of it is outdoor recreation. So putting messages through that, for example. But it's just getting the word out. And then people contact you to join the team. And the Montana team, for example, we had, I believe, 10 of us. 10 of us were on that team, including Rob, who is the leader, the manager of this program, who has also climbed all seven summits around the world, including Everest and Antarctica. Uh -huh everything. So it was really cool climbing with uh, somebody with that experience. So it's just a matter of leading the effort, communicating with personnel and a lot of communication. Once they establish it, yeah, they want to be on the team. It's the logistics and the timing and where to meet. And it's, it's fun coordinating that and just hearing the excitement of the people that want to do this. It, mm -hmm. you can, you can sense their passion too, but it's just an awesome thing, especially in military circles. There's something about, doing things with fellow military personnel that's kind of special, especially in an outdoor setting. And that was a lot of the excitement for this. And, and it turned You're out right. a great trip. Yeah. And, um, well, thank you for your service. I forgot to say that. Oh, thank you. And uh, you're right in that something about having other military people around you when you're taking on a challenge like this is very special. And also it's just something different for us. And I know that going into the mountains or just going on a hike, when it's not military related, it's kind of a relief. You can just kind of relax and let loose and the camaraderie and you're not, especially in a deployed location, for example, you, you still need to be cautious and aware of your surroundings. But this is just getting out there and having fun. It's, it's just a black. It I remember on Rainier, on our first day, we slept at Camp Muir at 10,000 feet. Mm -hmm. And right after we got up there, I, the first thing I did was just sleep. I don't know why, but I was tired. And then I woke up and, and we went to the dinner tent and I walked into the tent and I said, oh, I just had this great nap. And the guide said, oh, we're so happy that you were able to sleep. That's so good in the mountains. And I was still in the army in this time. And I thought, you're happy that I slept? Well, that's great. I mean, you're welcome. <laughs> no one's ever told me that before. You mentioned that people, after hearing the word about this challenge, they signed up. So they volunteered. Uh, nobody picked a team. Right. It's just a voluntary. Uh, joining on a volunteer based on timing. If you can get leave, for example, 
some we had reserve, we had guard, we had active duty. So oh. just depending on the people when they can get away too. Were they all coming from the same base? I understand that the guard and the reserve weren't, but were the active duty members coming from the same location? Um, we actually had some, to include ROTC, we had some students from Montana State University that were in ROTC that joined us. Okay. Um, active duty personnel came from California. I was in Florida. I was stationed at Tyndall Air Force Base at the time. Uh, we had people from New Mexico, really all over the country. And they flew into a location, got a rental car, and they drove up to where we met prior to the climb. So that, that's how it started. And so did you put out a training plan that they had to follow? Or did everyone just trust that they were um, just training in general to climb a mountain? Yeah, initially we did. Speaking with the manager, it, as you know, military personnel, for the most part, are in probably better condition than mo the average American citizen. And we, we, as you know, we have annual fitness requirements we have to meet. But we did put mm -hmm. a, I don't recall the exact parameters, but we had to, just to be able to run a mile under, I think, 7.30, maybe eight, eight minutes or something like that. Because mm -hmm. as you know, granite, uh, Montana is a tough one. It's a, it's a tough climb. Yes. It's quite yes. a few miles and rugged and steep. So there is a level of fitness required for that one that we wanted to at least have all team members be aware of the difficulty of it. I think that was really more of, portraying the, the difficulty and the seriousness of the climb, in, at least physical wise. Mm -hmm. Even though it's not as high as Mount Whitney or, or of course Denali, it is unique in its own challenges because it requires some rock climbing technique. And also the approach is pretty long, isn't it? I haven't climbed it. It is. There, I don't remember the miles, but maybe 11, 12 miles total each way, I believe. Maybe well, eight, I, I don't recall. But we did, we camped two nights. We started our hike. We went four or five miles, camped <laughs> uh, near a stream where we were trout fishing. And the next day we camped at just below the peak at one of the lakes. There's a lake just below the, the main okay. climb. And we camped there. And then the next day we summited and we came down from summit, grabbed our gear, and we went all the way out. So it, that was a long day. That was, oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it, was, it was brutal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so everyone's carrying their gear. Yeah, everything. And it, as you said, Granite Peak is a challenge. There's, there are some trails to start on the first maybe three quarters of the way. There's identifiable trails. But then when you get up to high camp or below the peak, there's not really a trail. And we, we decided to take the Southwest Collar route, Southwest Call. You could come around the other side, and I believe it's called the Froze to Death Plateau, where it does require technical climbing, belaying, rappelling, uh, like that. And not everybody on our team had that skill. The more dangerous route, and they call it the bowling alley, it's it's crazy. You're going up this funnel draw for a long ways, and it's really steep and so many loose rocks. And we actually did have some, one of our personnel that was up ahead, they had lodged, dislodged some rocks, and we had some people in the in the draw coming up and they actually had to hide behind rocks or some rocks would have seriously injured or hurt them really bad. But. So you're taking 10 airmen that you've never met before you started this hike, really, mm -hmm. and taking them up to the summit. And meanwhile, you're assessing their skills at the same time. Right. So you know, that being airmen, they have a baseline set of skills and fitness. But talk about assessing the risk along the way as you learned more about your teammates. As, as you'd mentioned earlier, some of the high points, some of the climbs are just simple trails going up. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, Granite Peak, Montana is part of that. But the last push up the mountain, I would say a mile, maybe a little more, which is no trail. It's more or less picking a route and then going up what we call the bowling alley, the draw. There's some skills more of not technical climbing ability, but self-awareness of how you can traverse up a, a location, an area without creating danger for others. And that's really what it is to be able to walk up this draw without dislodging rocks, knowing there's people behind you. And we had mm -hmm. an instance where we had one person that wasn't really skilled to the level of awareness like that. They weren't clumsy, mm -hmm. but they, they, they weren't really aware of the, the amount of carefulness that was needed to 
traverse like that with people below you. And that, and the incident that we had somebody almost get hurt, that they had to duck behind a wall to avoid these large rocks coming down. It was dislodged by a member and it, it scared some of the team. It really did. It could have been really, really bad. And at that point that kind of created the situation where uh, four out of our 10 people decided, yeah, this is just too much. This is crazy. And four of the 10 personnel decided, no, we've got to go back down. So we kind of just okay. took a time out. We paused, we, we talked through it and the four personnel on the, for the most part, they, it was self-awareness. Yeah, we, I, we can't do this. So they started heading down and we took the time because they're going down in the same location. We didn't want to try and go up and dislodge rocks on them as they're going down, but it was, okay. it was a challenge. They, they didn't have the skills at that time to do what needed to be done in a safe manner, but they were never even close to doing anything like that before. And as I mentioned in the article, if you read the article, they mm -hmm. attained some skills that they never experienced before. And the next time, I, I would say almost all of them could push through something like that again. Just seeing that for the first time and the danger involved is it's overwhelming. And it was for some people and they elected, mm -hmm. oh, this isn't for me this time. And we made it seven eighths of the way up the mountain and, but we just can't make this final push in a safe manner. So they decided to turn back. Yeah. Well, one of the skills I, I think you'd want any teammate to have is that sense of self-awareness. There's value in somebody bringing that to the table as opposed to the team leader having to say to that person, I don't feel safe going up with you or something like that. If that person is able to have the self-awareness to say, I don't feel comfortable, I'm going to turn around. That's huge. It is. And as you had mentioned earlier, and, and I too, it's about risk assessment, and risk analysis. That's one thing in the Air Force, and I'm sure all the military, we were trained very well how to recognize potential risk, how to react to risk, whether it be going for a bike ride after duty hours or going on a convoy outside the wire in a deployed location. As a team, you talk through that, and there's a lot of self-awareness that you you look at what is the worst thing that can happen, what can go wrong today, and you you look at that. So it's just, it's it's we're wired like that. We know what our skills are and what we can safely do and what we need to do to overcome challenges. So that it's, it's mm -hmm. easier in the military for, for folks like us. They, they did make that self choice and awareness that, yep, we can't do this. Nobody had to tell them, no, you can't go any further because you created a danger. No, you don't have the skills. It, it's something we know ourselves and, and that's a blessing. It really is as a team leader, especially. You're right. You're right. So now talk about after that moment, the rest of the trip. You know, after the, the four of the 10 people turned around and we gave them time to make sure they're out of the bowling alley before we proceeded, we maybe waited half an hour, 45 minutes. And mm -hmm. we started going up and we, because of the incident that occurred there, it even made us kind of hyper aware of what we really need to be careful with. Even though it wasn't one of us on the team that continued that dislodged some rocks, for example, we, we, we were more aware of it. Hey, we really got to be careful. And we talked through it as a team. We stuck close enough together where we could all communicate. There's parts of the Southwest call on Granite Peak that have ropes and fixed ropes. Uh, there's yeah. some areas, there was snow. As you'll see, there's some pictures posted in the article that you'll see that we encountered. But then we mm -hmm. kept going up this bowling alley. And at one point, you kind of get out of that situation. And there's huge rocks. And there's no trail, of course. So it's more or less using just what you can visually see above you to try and pick the correct route to the summit. There's nothing identifiable. There's no trail. There's no blazing. There's no rock cairns. And we made some good choices and we got to the summit and we had a blast. We did our, each member of the team, we did our 22 push-ups to remember those veterans that, that can't fight the demons, you know? So we do that almost in every, every high point I've climbed, but that program, they, they do that in every successful summit. Wow. That's very special. Now, you mentioned the navigation challenges after the bowling alley. Did you have a map or a GPS, or was it all visual? It's really visual, but the challenge there, you can't really, you can't see the summit because it's the the terrain, it's kind of this, and you can't see where the summit is. If it was straight up and you could see the summit, it'd be different, but it's not. And you more or less just keep going vertical as much as you can, because you know if you're going vertical, you're going higher. 
and we mm -hmm. just went vertical. We went off the bowling alley, either to the right or left, I don't recall. And we just mm -hmm. kept going vertical. And at one point we got up there high enough, hey, there's a summit and you could see it. So it's, it's wow. an educated guess in that, for that specific peak bow, but, but, but it worked out. It was safe and we made it and, and we had, we had just had a blast. It was fun. Yeah. Did you see anyone else on their way to the summit? No, we didn't. We were the only ones up there. There was another group that got into the high camp down by the lake as we were leaving, but they were summiting the, the next day. So that okay. that's another thing in that bowling alley. If, if you're one team going up and you somehow dislodge rocks that you can communicate with your team, uh, rocks, you know, you, you yell rocks so the people below can look up and avoid. But there yeah. could be another team down two, three, four hundred meters that you can't communicate with. And they sure. hear of a call for danger. But we were fortunate nobody was following us and nobody was above us either, which is good. Yeah, that's something that you would really have to time and stagger if there was mm -hmm. another team. You really had to coordinate that. But right. you're right. You did lucky in that they were planning to summit the next day. Yeah. So talk about the way down. Now, did you meet the team members who decided to turn away after the bowling alley and then you all descended together? They actually went down to the high camp where we had left our tents. When we left to summit that day, we left our camp up in case mm -hmm. of the reason, uh, weather, something like that. We, we had to retreat back to camp and maybe summit the next day as we went out. Yeah. Of course, but the weather was great. We summited. So they went down to, to the camp. And when we came down, we met there. We took camp down and we, we hiked out and that that's where yeah. we were at the camp. Okay. So how many days total did it take from start to end? Uh, we started hiking in, we camped one night, we got to high camp, camp that night. And then the next day we summited and went all the way out. So it was a three day, it was mm. a total of three days. And, it, and we kind of laughed about this, but you can actually take horses in like seven eighths of the way. I mean, looking at these people, like, why would you want to do a high point and, cheat or you know it it's kind of a pride thing but it just it didn't make sense to us that people would do that but i could see if somebody was physically handicapped and but they're not going to be able to make the summit anyway maybe they just wanted to see the peak from down below but that was kind of surprising mm -hmm. for us and also this, this is mentioned in the article the summit success for granite peak is 20 percent. we had 60 percent, so we were fortunate and it turned out to be a great a great climb you quoted that the Forest Service said that it's a 10 to 20 percent summit rate. Right. So is the turnaround point typically around that bowling alley area? I would say the start of it. What we had, we had some maps, some really detailed kind of side profile of the mountain where you, you go up and trying to, if I could get from this angle, the mountain, mm -hmm. like the mountain there, you go up to the left a little bit and that's where the bowling alley starts and it goes up to this angle. And then the summit's up there. So, but we stood back and we took our map out and we could see, yeah, there's, there's kind of the approach. It looks like a manageable approach to the bowling alley. And you kind of see the draw where the bowling alley is. So, but that's okay. how we saw it and we viewed it, but we talked about it. We, we had uh, phones with um, maps within. We could see a topographical from you know, satellite from above. And talk about the, the camaraderie of the team and how you saw everybody. I don't know if they changed or if you saw any kind of growth and strength or character. And I know it was only three days, but talk about that a little bit. If you saw any of that at all. Yeah. As you know, being in the military, when you're in a deployed location or on duty, you're, you're somewhat restricted in what you can do to relax and just be yourself. Mm -hmm. But when you get in the outdoors like this, you're, we had officers, we had enlisted, we had active duty reserve guard ROTC. There was no rank out there. There was nothing official, but mm -hmm. we, but you bond like that because of the, the, the difficulties you go through together. Not even if you've never served with those personnel, you know that they've also been through difficult times and we've almost all deployed to bad locations yeah. in our career. And so we know we've been through hardships. And when you can get away from that, you really bond. You really do. And mm -hmm. in regards to climbing, some of us, well, as I mentioned, one of our team members has actually climbed all seven summits, Rob, our, our program manager for this for this program. And it, but he related stories. We'd sit down and we'd, on our two camp nights, we'd get to camp and we'd get a little fire going. We'd sit around and so we maybe brought some little pints of something to keep us warm. <laughs> and we enjoyed some of that, and but we talked mm -hmm. about things. Uh, 
deployments or camaraderie and and things how we can help each other uh, through difficulties, for example, how we do things like this. We kind of talked through the program and how we each felt. And it, it was a great bonding moment. It really was. And the next day we got up and made the summit. And as I'd mentioned, we made some great risk assessments. And then we came down to the people that turned around. And it's like the, nothing bad happened. They, as I yeah. said before, they went beyond any level they ever did before. To get to that point, to even get up there, they, they've never done anything close to that. And so they were rewarded really in that way too, even though they didn't get the summit that we all, we were all rewarded in some way, not just because some of us made the summit, but we got to do this for some very special people that we really bonded with. Oh, I think the bonding element is so special. And any time that you get to do that in the outdoors, I think that just elevates the experience. And I hope that that program continues and maybe even spreads to other military branches because I think that's so great. And I like that it was recognized too. And I'm, like I said, I'm going to put the link to those, um, to that article, in the show notes. And um, so after that, so you guys spent this time training and then you have your time on the mountain and everything goes well. Then what? Did people say, well, we want to climb another mountain or we want to train for something else? Like what? Was there any talk about like what's next? There is, but when you have a team like that from so many different locations and uh, in, you're, as you know, in military, we deploy on little notice and who knows, you can't really plan that far ahead for anything. So really <laughs> the planning factor is maybe two to three months out is all we can really do. But we talked about it. We came down that after, that was a brutal day all the way from, high camp to the top of the summit and all the way out and what well, took us two days earlier, but, and wow. right away we didn't, went into a small town. I can't recall the town that's near the, the approach to the trail, but we went into a restaurant. we had like the biggest burgers or steaks we could find just dying of just tired <laughs> and wiped out and, and, and emotionally, physically. It was, it was just, it, it, we were really wiped out and the had a couple yeah. beers. We had great food and, we bonded again. It was like kind of a long goodbye. So it was fun. So did anyone that you served with in Florida go with you, or were you the only one from that station? I was the only one from my Air Force base specifically, but I've I've actually kept in touch with pretty much everyone. They're all my Facebook friends. We, we communicate once in a while. We have been cool. talking about going and doing two different mountains, Denali and uh, the Wyoming one, which is a tough one too. That's like four or five days, a long trip. Denali yeah. is prohibitive to some personnel because of the cost and the logistics and the equipment involved. And we, I think we could all that were on that trip, we could do, we could tackle Denali, but just mm -hmm. uh, the time, it could be three weeks. It could be even more. And, and, and being in yeah. the you know, that that's hard. That's three quarters of your leave for the year. I know. So that, that's a tough oh. call, but, but we yeah. have talked about it. We're considering uh, the Wyoming Gannett Peak, and that's mm -hmm. four or five days maybe, which isn't too bad, but we're still motivated. We're still passionate for it, and the fun we had in our climb, it showed us a lot, and mm -hmm. we do want to do it again. We really do. It's, I can't yeah. express how special something like that is. Really, it's difficult. I know. I know. Well, I can't um, comprehend it because I've never done anything like that, but I think I can understand just mm -hmm. because I, as you're describing it, I thought, wow, that would just be so cool. And um, you know, I wish I had an opportunity like that when I was in, mm -hmm. but the people who were able to do that are very lucky. And like you said, they still have the motivation. They still want to go out and do it. That's, that's the important impression I think that was left after that mountain. So did any of them, after climbing the highest peak in Montana, I want to climb the highest peak in every state or the lower 48? Yeah, some of them have. I've been following them on Facebook, for example. And I, it, it's ironic that about not even a year after we did Granite Peak, one of my team members was actually at the New Mexico high point a week before. So that was cool. Really? But we didn't really coordinate on any doing of that, but we just... He posted pictures or something, and hey, I'm going there next week. I'm, I'm taking leave from Florida, and I'm, I'm going out there to climb New Mexico. So that was cool. But yeah, we're, everybody, I think it kind of triggered something in, in everyone to 
continue the challenge of mountains. It really did. Yes, that's huge. And also, it it's a great start knowing that they already reached one of the more difficult peaks. <laughs> <laughs> the outdoors are, are awesome for healing. As you had said, you, you've deployed too. And we all have a level of challenge in life that have affected us. And mm -hmm. mountains are a great healing opportunity. They really are. It's just, I don't know if it's challenging yourself physically, um, getting up to the highest point in the area to talk to somebody. Who knows? Yes. Yes, you're right. Well, the achievement is definitely a factor because mm -hmm. it does build confidence and it shows you that you can do things that maybe you didn't think you could. And I think being in the outdoors, not just on a mountain, but it, you develop your autonomy and your self-sufficiency and that leads to confidence and confidence can often help you overcome challenges that you're going through in your life. And sometimes it all starts in the outdoors. That's so powerful. It does. That's a great point. And it's a healing that it's indescribable. And I think I talk about some of that in the article that you're going to post a link to. But yeah. As you know, I don't, I'm retired now and I miss the air force tremendously. I, Miss the camaraderie, the challenge, the clear lines of direction. You know what's expected of you, personnel that you lead. They know what's expected of them. And we come into the yeah. civilian world and we struggle. We, we don't adapt really well sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, mountains, it, it's like it's something bigger than you, yourself. The military, you're serving for something bigger than yourself. And you miss that. And to climb a mountain to challenge yourself and accomplish something of that magnitude that in itself is healing. It really is. You're right. I'm not retired, but I did uh, get out of the military last year. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important on this side to set challenges for yourself because no one's going to do that for you. No one's going to say, okay, this is your next thing that you have to achieve. This is in your timeline. You have to do that yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think outdoor endeavors is a great way to do that. It is exactly great point. It, it's a great way to do that. It is. It, it's hard to describe how healing or what, what you feel on a level of accomplishment. And I, I know everyone that climbs high points, there's everyone has a different level of euphoria or accomplishment or pride when they, they summit a mountain. And yeah, it, it's different for everyone. But for those of us that have been in the military, we miss that, that something bigger than ourselves, And that's what it gives me. And I know for a lot of military personnel, it does. Oh, that's perfect. You know, after I summited Whitney and Rainier, um, I got a summit certificate and mm -hmm. I, I did what I used to do in the military and I framed it, oh, cool. <laughs> I don't know if you, but I put the certificate and then an American flag patch. And then right below that, a patch of the mountain that says the elevation. Mm -hmm. And then one of the pictures is my husband and I on the base and then my husband and I on the summit. And it's just, it reminds me of, you know, the awards, uh, <laughs> when you yes or something and you put everything in a frame and present it. And I was like, well, I can do that for my summit certificates now. That's right. Awesome. <laughs> and while we don't have the same community or sense of camaraderie now that we did in the military, I think that communities like the high pointers club do serve that purpose in a way because you get a lot of like-minded people who all have the same goal and they're all sharing stories, trip reports, advice, and things like that, and kind of cheering each other on. And that's what I like about the community, whether, you know, you're on a social media platform of high pointers, or if you belong to the club, I think just having those things available is really helpful. And it really increases your enthusiasm for the endeavor. It does. Uh, as you had mentioned about the social media platforms, I've shared trip reports and some mm -hmm. are really detailed. Uh, New Mexico, for example, I went up, it was really early in the year. There were maybe one set of tracks I could see in the snow that may have went before me, but just leaving detailed trip reports to help people. It's so, all of these mountains, you really don't know what to expect 100%. You really can't, no matter what you read for trip reports or online mountain reports, climbing reports, you really don't. But if you have people like us in this community, we have a sense of trying to help each other. And that, that really goes a long ways. So you did Wheeler Peak in the winter? It was, it was late April or early May, I believe. May, I think if I remember May 10th, because somebody just the other day was considering going to 
Uh, no, it was Boundary, Boundary Peak, Nevada. Mm -hmm. It was Boundary, Nevada. And somebody had made a post on the 50 High Points uh, Facebook page. And they mm -hmm. said, I'm considering doing a Boundary May 5th, the week of May 5th or 7th or something like that. And I'm thinking, boy, that's pretty close to when I did Boundary. And I look back into my Facebook post, my trip report, and I did it May 10th. And I he saw okay. my trip report from way back four or five years ago. And and after I referred him to it, oh, this is awesome. I, I know it's possible. But again, weather, who knows? As you can see this winter, we're getting more snow here in Idaho than we have in the last, I believe, three or four years. So wow. there could be more snow this year in some of these higher western peaks. So who knows? It might extend the the ability to climb by two, three weeks. Who knows? You're right. Yeah. And well, and that's the other thing about high pointing is you do have to be somewhat flexible in your plans because the weather can change. But if you have the luxury of waiting, well, that's a benefit. Yeah. There's always a weather window. We ran into that in Ancacago, Argentina. And you're really? up 22,000 feet. We, our high camp was over 20. We had to sleep at over 20,000 two nights and below okay. zero and 60 mile an hour winds. And they're on the radio with uh, personnel down at main camp trying to get a weather window. And Mother Nature, you, you, you'd have to work around her every time. Yeah. So what happened? It, uh, we had... It took us probably seven or eight, nine days maybe to get to high camp, and we had some bad weather. It was, I don't recall what month it was, but of course, south of the equator, it's a different, it's a different season. And we had yeah. uh, summit one morning, it was about three in the morning, and there were probably uh, 50, 60, 70 other climbers up there from all over the world. And it was, I remember there was a, a Chinese group that had about a dozen people, and we made our summit attempt. We made it probably within 500 feet of the summit, and the weather was just brutal. It was, you couldn't see 10 feet in front of you, 50, 60 mile hour winds, it was below zero. And we made the call wow. as a team, and no, we, we can't do this. It's not worth the risk. It, it was bad. And we started coming wow. down about uh, a half mile back down, you know, to where the high camp was. And the, the Chinese group that was climbing, they were coming up as we were coming down on the same for the most part trail, they followed our tracks up because they figured mm -hmm. we probably know where we're going. And we had an experienced guide. It wasn't a formal, but we, we had a team. And as we're going mm -hmm. down, I'm like, no, down, don't, don't, no, yeah. down. And they ignored us. And here the next day, two of them were missing. And the, the weather was so bad, you couldn't see a couple feet in front of you. They lost two of their climbers. And they were up there overnight. They did eventually come down. They got down before sun up. And the whole next day, I think it was maybe late afternoon, they, they had a rescue team went up and found them. They, they lost some fingers or something, frostbite. And, but we, we oh tried warning them. And unfortunately, that same year, there were two Americans that went up too fast, and they, they didn't make it. There were two, and they had to leave them up there all winter and get them out the next spring. As you know, mountain, mountaineering is dangerous. They, they went too fast. They didn't. Uh, climb high, sleep low, climb high, sleep low, climb high in a mountain of 23,000 feet almost. It's pretty critical that you do it correctly. And they didn't. And unfortunately, they didn't make it. So, Oh, that's so tragic. It is. That's very unfortunate. Yeah. It's a serious but, uh, mountain. It really is. And it's yes. it's satisfying, but it, it's a serious mountain. Wow. Arrow, it's, it was satisfying, too. That was maybe six days up and down. But that was a good experience, too. It was it was a lot of fun. And I, actually, both of these trips, I took leave when I was deployed to Afghanistan for 13 months, each each deployment. And I, I took a few days to come home, you know, about mid-deployment. But the other time for my leave, I actually took and went to Africa to climb Kilimanjaro. My next 13-month tour, I went to Argentina and climbed Ancacagua. That It was that passionate, that passionate wow. key to do that. And it helped being in a deployed location and that was uh, it. That was healing, as you you've been deployed too. But we were in a remote location. You know, our, our camp was two hundred meters by two hundred meters. We couldn't really you couldn't run, you couldn't train. But we did have some mountains nearby that we'd often pretty much every Friday we'd we'd arm up and we'd go outside the wire and climb these local mountains. We were very fortunate to do that. Our camp wow. was about seven thousand feet, and these mountains were maybe about ten or eleven. But we'd go up and take the American flag up, and there we were fortunate mm -hmm. that we had a mountain to do that. Yes. We need to challenge ourselves and 
push our mm-hmm. push ourselves to go beyond what we typically would, and that is healing. It really is. You're right. Uh, one of the things that I've been asking podcast guests, and this is just because I just want to know, um, is what is your favorite adventure book or podcast or documentary? Because a lot of times we can't get out there, you know, yeah. like on a deployment, for example, or when you're in um, active duty, you know, it's just, it's hard to get out in nature sometimes. And so for a lot of us, the way to do that is to immerse ourselves in, in adventure related media or in books or documentaries. Really, for me, it is the social media on the, the Facebook 50 high points page. Yeah. You follow other people that have maybe done the same mountains as you. They've maybe encountered mm-hmm. different challenges, different difficulties. But you look to those because not all of us have climbed all 50 state high points. And you're always looking to learn mm-hmm about ones you're interested in, like Gannett Peak, Wyoming, for example, is a really tough one too. So yeah. you're always watching for people who have climbed Gannett, for example, what did they encounter? How long did it take? What trail did they use? There's different approaches. What equipment mm-hmm. did they take? Did they encounter bears? There's so many things that you can't know until you get out there. But if you follow this page, for example, the rest of us that have done this, you can learn so much. That's really my favorite. And not just yeah. to learn from for you, but for you to share. Because you know you're helping people and everybody else is looking for the same thing we are, you know. So. That's very true. Yeah, trip reports are so important. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's not just like a selfish thing, like, hey, look what I did. You're actually helping someone else who wants to climb that mountain. Exactly. Yeah, and that's rewarding too. Well, I can see the sunset uh, behind you. It just, the sky looks so beautiful. Oh, yeah, it's even pink. Yeah, it, it's a blessing yeah. to have its view every morning and every night. <laughs> yeah, do you like Idaho? I do. I've, I was, I actually came TDY here to Mountain Home Air Force Base, Idaho, a, f- a few times. And mm-hmm. my son and I actually come out here every summer to go to our gold claims. We actually dredge for gold on a creek uh, in the what? southwest part of the state. So we spent six weeks out here in the summer to do that. But we, I've what? always loved Idaho. I used to hunt here, but I don't hunt anymore. But it's been a special okay. state. I like it here. Yeah. Have you reached the high point? No, that's what I'm going to do this year. I've already talked to my son about that. That Perfect. when we actually, I go back to Wisconsin in April, finishing this caretaker position and working with my campsites in the summer. Then I have somebody that kind of takes care of that for me when my son and I come out to Idaho for six weeks to get gold on our claims. But on the way out this year, we're going to stop at Bora and we're going to climb it together. It's just a day up and down. It's pretty, it's, yeah. it's a tough hike one day up and down, but we can do it. So yeah, I want to get that one for sure this summer. Oh, that's awesome. Well, be sure to post something about it. I will. I'll do a great trip report. I promise. Oh, great. <laughs> you had talked about before what was my favorite one. And I talked about Aconcagua and Argentina and, and Kilimanjaro. But there's one hike. It's not really a climb. It's not a high point that at this point in my life is probably the only one I would repeat. It was life changing. I actually did a 56 mile hike on the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu in Peru. Wow. It's not a high point, I know, and that's what this is about, but that was life-changing. Seeing the, the architecture and, and how these civilizations lived and survived over 56 miles of going through five different old communities from 100 wow. years ago, you know, and that was amazing. I, I went alone, but I actually hooked up on a trip with two Canadian, the Canadian couple. It was actually their honeymoon. So I was able wow. to get pictures for them. They were really appreciative of that, but it was special. So if you get a chance to cl- do the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu, you can take a bus almost right to Machu Picchu. You know, the, the famous mountain view civilization, yeah. but do the trail. It's it's life-changing. That's one I would like to do again. Probably the only one, really. And there's so many rewarding things out there in the outdoors. Sometimes you have to go far. Maybe it's a mountain in the backyard. I see these mountains here and I, there's no trails up there. I would love to climb that mountain there. It's uh, eight or 9,000 feet and I'm here at four. So it'll be a challenge, but there's no trails, but I'm not going to do it in four feet of snow, but <laughs> yeah, I'm going to a challenge. <laughs> when you tell people who don't know what high pointing is, uh, that you're doing it, what do they say? I didn't know there was such a thing. Uh, I just thought maybe you like to climb hills and mountains, but <laughs> yeah. Well, you do. Yeah, when I uh, 10 years ago, I didn't know there was really a special designation for high pointing to climb the high point of each state. I, I really didn't know that. But it makes total sense to us now. I mean, it's a 
it's a specific challenge that we can accomplish. You know, it's a goal. But yeah, I, 10 years ago, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know somebody designated it as anything special. Which high point is your favorite? Let me guess. <laughs> Montana, because of the experience. It, so let's say apart from that, which one is your favorite? Uh, probably Boundary. I, I did it alone. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it was it was challenging. I mean, just physically up and down in one day. And early it was cold. I think when I left the, the vehicle to, to go on the trail, it was low 30s or high 20s and windy. It was cold, but yeah. that was that was a special one. And I like that, but of course, yes, Montana. The camaraderie and the challenge. It sums down, so it's uh, time to throw some wood for fire and settle in for the wow. night.